Welcome to the Innovators by Scandinavian Man, a podcast about our changing world with the people who influence it. On this show, we cover some of the best and brightest minds within design, culture, fashion, technology, and sustainability. Mostly, but not always, from a Scandinavian perspective. I'm Conrad Olson, and my guest today is Fredrik Karlström, founder of Alma, a Stockholm-based co-working place and members club. Alma has been called the coolest workplace by Vogue magazine, the anti-WeWork by Surface magazine, and been on the Condé Nast Traveler's hot list. Fredrik is also the founder of the furniture brand Austere. He's a creative director and entrepreneur that works both here in Stockholm and in New York, where he currently lives. Fredrik, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I think it, it perhaps start with the with the concept of the members club and co working place because it's a concept that's been under quite some scrutiny recently with the debacle around WeWork and everything. Um, so I wanted to start with a more like a philosophical question: Why why are co working places and member clubs why are they important today? Well, I think <coughs> I think that the co working model is not super new it's been around for a fairly long time and i think the current state of 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 the we work um was fairly predictable i think for most people uh who who saw it from the inside but um i, I think you have to remember that you know it was it was valued at quite a bit of money before softbank came in and it's still valued at eight billion dollars so it's not a complete collapse i think um and i don't think that that co-working is going anywhere i mean there's lots of data that suggests that that lots of people will continue to work that way but um but to answer your question why it's important i mean i i i don't think co-working is important as in itself but i think that the way that we work is changing and has changed for for some time i mean i read some statistic now that 30 percent of the of the workforce will will spend at least five days a month not in their regular office, right, you know, and so that there's a huge shift, um, and we see that trend not going away. Um, and I think that the, the the need for people to congregate is not going anywhere. Mm. So it, it just makes sense from a lot, from from cultural perspective. It makes sense from an economic perspective. If you're a small if you're a small company or a startup, I think it makes a huge amount of sense to to sit in a co working type environment than to get your own office and I mean you have an office you know all the stuff that it goes into it. Was it when, when you started uh, Alma what was what was the things you wanted to do differently perhaps than than other other similar concepts <coughs> yeah I mean at its core you know we're a co-working space you know we're like a we work we're, we're profitable which mm. is the big difference <laughs> than from we work <laughs> uh, and most of the other ones but um, I think you know both all the all the people who started it, we we all live in New York, and I think we saw the co working and the social club trend happening, and we this opportunity to do something in Stockholm came up very kind of randomly. Mm. Uh, this building became available, and, and somebody asked us if we wanted to do something, and so we kind of took that opportunity. And I think looking at Stockholm uh, was actually kind of terrifying because you know Stockholm a doesn't have the history of, of sort of social membership clubs and, and, and the willingness to pay for that kind of service is not not really in our culture. Um, we care deeply about design and community and family and, and collaboration, I think, is very much in, 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 the, in the fabric of the city. And uh, Stockholm is incredibly trend-sensitive. So it's kind of terrifying to, to, to open something here. And I think we looked at the market and we felt that there was a there was a place missing for us, you know, which was much more nurturing, a bit more you know, on a place that you wanted to spend time. And we looked at some of the other concepts were, that felt more like Excel products, mm -hmm. like somebody looked at, at the math and, and sort of figured out, oh, this is going to make sense. And I don't think that that doesn't resonate with, with us at, at least. So, so I think we felt that if you could make it here in Stockholm, you could make it anywhere because Stockholm is kind of a terrifying market in some ways. Um, inverted New York logic. Y yeah, I mean, a little bit. And I think now, I mean, we we also did it differently in that we 
you know, we raised, I mean, this maybe it's too technical, but we raised money and, and all the renovations and all the furniture and all the stuff we paid for. Mm. And we got to do it the way we wanted it to. Typically, you go to a landlord and they do the build outs and, and then mm. you put that on the rent. Um, so we have actually a very good rent and, and, and we were able to do the concept exactly like we wanted. And now when we go meet real estate owners, uh, we in a very different uh, position to negotiate. We can say, well, Alma's working. We want it at that, at that standard, and, and um, you'll have to build that out. So d- f- for someone who hasn't been to an Alma property, uh, describe the concept, because it's you know obviously beautifully designed. It's rife with sort of this you know design elements, beautiful furniture. Uh, how would you describe the, the milieu? I mean, I... I th- <coughs> I mean, you've been there, so <laughs> you just described it, I guess. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, even in the name, that you know, we took the name Alma, which mm. means a bunch of different things. It means nourishing in Latin, it means soul in Spanish. And in, in, in English, you say, you know, the, the university or school you went to, you went to mm. is your Alma Mater, mm. which comes from the University of Bologna, which is the oldest um, university in, in the Western world. And it basically means nourishing mother. And the metaphor is that the university gave you intellectual nourishment. It was right. the mother of your intellectual journey. And so we wanted this to be a place that was about nourishing creative people or, or uh, people and their ideas or hospitality for ideas sort of thing. So the consequence of that, um, if that is what you set out to do, then the consequence of that is obviously to, to make it um, comfortable, you know, maybe a bit more homey. Uh, um, you know, our lighting is different. We use these uh, architects to help us with kind of the structural uh, changes. Uh, Tom Didegord, a very amazing um, uh, Swedish architecture firm. We worked with all these amazing brands to, to decorate uh, or to put furniture in, I should say. And, and so, you know, Fredericia and P.P. Mebler and KBH and uh, De La Spada, like these, these mm. brands that you typically see in a sort of a luxury home, not in a office space and um, you know we worked with artists and we worked with galleries to put actual art on the walls as opposed to sort of neon inspirational quotes uh, like some of our <laughs> competitors do <laughs> which it, you know and I think it's just trying to create something for for yourself that you'd want to be and you know we, we hired uh, these two chefs Leon Martin to who, who were cooking at the at him mm. when when, uh, when we started to kind of set the to build our kitchen and to set the Concept, and they hired our current chef Goran Himlund, who it's just a different experience. I mean, it's, it feels very sort of braggadocious to, to say, but I think anyone who's been there will attest to the fact that our lunch is not typical like lunch food. You know, and we opened a bar which became it's a watering hole, I think. And there's Sanska Dalbrot just told us that we're the one of the five best bar in, in Sweden. So, right. it's, so it's I think it's a little bit of a different. Approach and do you, do you feel like you've you've attracted a new kind of uh, uh, sort of member a new kind of new kinds of companies that are willing to, I guess, pay extra or, or be part of this type of milieu, rather than uh, <coughs> you know a traditional type startup? Because I think that in the, you know if you think of a startup, you th- you don't necessarily think of a company that cares about uh, uh, a, a carefully a curated or carefully designed environment. It's more like uh, something playful and colorful and, and, and so forth. I don't know. Is that true? I don't know. I, mean, it's, it's, I think of Silicon Valley. I don't think I don't think of this very very you know elegance that that you represent. Right. No. I mean, I think no. That's probably true. I think a lot of technology companies have a terrible sense of style, uh, even bigger ones. I, th- I love going to these conferences and you see these l- logotypes and it's almost like it's clip art from like right. you know, Microsoft Word. <laughs> and uh, and I think that sometimes they think it's cute. I think it's, I think good companies don't do bad design. Mm. Um, and so I, I think, I, I mean, our members, it's not that we're not that much more expensive than some of the other places. It's not, it's not necessarily that. I think it's, it's for people who care about those things um, it, I think it attracts a certain person, mm. um, but I mean, I think it's still very playful. I think it's still quite. I mean, we're quite sort of spiritual, almost to the border to the point of being sort of a hipster. I mean, um, sp- spiritual to the point of being uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
hippie. You know, it's like we have right. tarot readings in the bar and we do, you know, we have tons of poetry and seminars about mindfulness. And I mean, it's, I, I think there's a, there's a huge amount of playfulness at Alma. And, and I think uh, the type of members that come to Alma, it's, the easiest way is almost describing it is that there are hotel chains in the world that are, you know, they're, they're great because you know what you get. They're mm. the same everywhere and mm. every city has it. And, and then there's the small luxury hotels of the world where the, hotels, the properties are different, there's a different type of charm to it. Um, we aspire to the latter, not the former. And, um, yeah. So when you create these types of, of, of concepts and when you created Alma, do you go both from a sort of gut feeling uh, or, or, or do you only go from a gut feeling or do you also go from, from a sort of uh, um, uh, finding the data, finding the statistics on how these types of environments should work for this target group? What's, what's the process for, for creating this? Or, <laughs> or is it ever evolving together with the members? Well, it's uh, ever evolving. I think physical space just has yeah. that by nature because there's you know, it, it's, you can kind of create the stage, you can create the four walls, but then the people who are in there and the things that happen in there is, is what makes it special and different. But uh, we we obviously look at data, but I think my data points are not, um, it's not, it's, it's inspirational and more sort of um, looking at sp spaces and places in the world throughout the history that have been great for innovation. Like, I'm inspired by... Bell Labs and, and the Manhattan Project and mm. MIT Media Labs and you know um, what do you, what do you get from those those types of uh, inspiration points? I mean, how you create a a place that foster innovation and right. foster you know human interaction. I mean, there's there's this amazing um, this amazing story around Bell Labs uh, in the in the fifties and how they were creating more sort of Nobel Prize winners and, and various awards than any place on earth. And they started looking at why that was. And they found out that it kind of came back to this one guy, um, this engineer called Harun Nykvist, who actually was, had a Swedish uh, heritage. And he would do these lunches. Um, and the people who went to these lunches were the ones who won all these awards. And the ones who didn't, didn't. And it was all based around cross-disciplinary things and meeting different uh -huh. sort of types of people, but also that he was very good at asking these very poignant questions and, and sort of pushing people forward in their work. And I think there's, throughout history, massive amounts of data or, or just, um, you know, abstract expressionists in New York or, you know, Sigmund Freud and his gang. And there's tons of these groups where um, the, the, the group helped elevate the work of, of, all, of all its members. Mm. And so I think... I mean, there's certain spaces and, and restaurants and bars and universities and offices that are just, there's something in the walls. There's something magical in that space. And um, that's what, what inspires me, uh, reading about the How do you find these examples? Is it just, are you like a history a nerd? Or yeah. You, yeah, I'm a history nerd. I, no, and I, you know, we, I travel a lot. I try to visit these places if mm. I can and, and talk to people who've been around it people who've been in these, and it can be in any industry or any, you know, theater companies or uh, creative agency type uh, mm. uh, people or, you know, restaurant owners. I mean, having a restaurant and a bar now, it gives me a whole other sense uh, and a whole other level of respect for the amount of work that goes into creating an environment that we want. I mean, you know, right. we've been all out, you know, in restaurants and bars for our whole life, Right. And you maybe you don't think about that, you know, think that much about all the work that goes into it. But like to create a, a space and fill it, uh, make money on it, and make guests feel happy is 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 really hard. Mm. Uh, and there's some places in the world that, I mean, you know, um, there's a restaurant that I love in, in New York called Raoul's. It's been around since I think '85 or something like that. Or maybe it's even where is it at? It's on Pr uh, Prince Street between. Okay. Uh, it's in Soho, Prince and uh, Thompson, and it's been around forever. And the, and the atmosphere is just fantastic. And, you know, what is that about? And there's, I mean, Indochine you've heard of. And there's, there's these places that have been around for a long time. And um, there's something that is inspiring to me. And it's, it's quite analog. You know, it's, it's the process is, you know, I, in my mind, it's, uh, you know, this idea of, of creating a community, which is, which is, for me, it's more than just a marketing sort of buzzword. Uh, it's actually really 
believing that a community is is important. Yeah. I think designing to that community, creating a space that is that makes sense. Um, it's uh, food and beverage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People like to eat and drink, um, and, and 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 then programming it. You know, having tons of different events and, and speakers and like opportunity for people to meet mm. those those to me are the kind of the that's the formula let's let's get back to the formula i think i, I want to dive into that but i want to go back to something you said earlier but I, mean, I, I i think having uh the manhattan project as an you know source of inspiration for a, a modern day co-working space is is uh, I, I got stuck on that somehow and to me it's like you don't hear an architect just you know talk about spaces in the way you talk about them. Uh, do you think you have something? Uh, do you feel like you really have a different perspective, not being an architect, coming from sort of a more conceptual point of view? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think I think if you go to an architect, you get architecture, and um, you know, I think, and if you go to a graphic designer, you get graphic design, mm. and, and so that's I'm neither of those two things, and so for me, it's. It's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's like, what's the output? What's the, what's the, what's the gut feeling? What's mm. the kind of the intangible experience mm. that you want to get to? And then everything else is, is a consequence of that, mm. you know? And I think, I think, I mean, I, you know, I'm a fairly sort of surly person, you know, and I, and I, what do you mean by that? No, I'm I'm a curmudgeon. I'm a you know grumpy, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you know I was asked by someone just this past week. You know they they were remodeling something, and they're like, "Do you have mm -hmm. a good interior designer? Can you give me some names?" And of course, I can give them some names, but it's like, what are you doing? You know, what are the things? You, it's like you know I'm throwing a party. Do you know Do you know a good uh, party fixer? Like, what kind of party is it? Is it a children's birthday party? Is it a wedding? Is it a corporate event? Is it a bachelor party? You know what I mean? Like, and mm. the the difference between those parties is pretty spectacular. You know, do you have a clown or do you have strippers? Like, mm. it's a fairly you know broad spectra. So to me, it's like this idea of, uh, yeah, we're gonna remodel something. What do you want to achieve? Mm. You know, is it who's it for? How often are you? Are there lots of people? Not a lot of people? Mm. Is there a uh, a red thread you want to you want to say you know all, all the people here are young designers or it's about having a lot of people in and out and we have to be flexible the space has to be move around a lot or mm -hmm. it should feel it should impress someone when they walk in the door mm -hmm. and I, I think and, and I think architects start there too I guess but but um, I don't know I, I only have my process and it's 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 about trying to figure out what you want to achieve and then the, the consequences of that decision becomes fairly clear mm -hmm. I think uh, so uh, so w with Alma, what was it then? What did you want to achieve? Was it, uh, you know, I want to have companies that uh, create stuff in this direction or I want the people who work here to be, you know, 50% more, uh, you know, productive or enjoy their work 50% more than other? It, it was, it was uh, not about attracting companies. It was about tr attracting people. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we are, all our memberships are individual. Mm. And I think that it, it was about creating a space for, interesting people to want to hang out you know and to 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 uh work together to enjoy uh enjoy their work and to i mean you know almost almost role in the ecosystem is to create these physical spaces for people's passions you know mm -hmm. i think you know we when we opened um there was some sort of questions about i think people heard private member club and they thought oh do you have to be you know, do you have to be very wealthy or do you have to have a certain last name or, you know, mm. and, um, and the way that I thought about it and the way we talked about it was like, it's not about, it's not about being, you know, having a nice last name. It, 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 it's about, in Sweden, we have a lot of foreningsliv, <laughs> cooperatives, right? Mm. There's mulle and there's sailing and, and, and all that stuff. That's what we are. The only difference is, if you're a member of a, a golf club, you're you're, the, you're there because you, you have a passion for golf. If you're a member of Alma, your passion is your work. Mm. And then we do other things together, like the golf club has Christmas parties and midsummer parties. So do we. But the the the, the mortar, the thing that puts everybody together, is is their passion for their sort of their creative output. I remember at one point you told me also that there was a um, when you started coming from New York, you had a different different 
definition of what a creative was. I mean, I think if for like in Stockholm or in Sweden, we th- when we think of a creative person, we think of the actual art director or the painter or someone who actually does something um, traditionally, you know, c- creative. But if in 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 New York or in the U.S., it's more like uh, you can be an entrepreneur and be a creative. Yeah. Uh, how how did you reason around that? I, you know, I mean, when we when we launched, we wrote everything in English. So mm. we said we're a, we're a member club for creatives, and I think. I think a lot of people read it as creator, right. and, and and that is an art director or copywriter in an ad agency, mm. typically here. And um, and we certainly have some of those, but I think for us, it's if you're a chef, if you're a um, an entrepreneur, if you're a tech person, if you are a media person, an artist, a writer, a poet, you're obviously a creative. Mm. Um, so th- the word is maybe a little bit broader in, in English than it is in Swedish. So it just took a little adjustment, but. Uh, do you think that has changed since you opened? It, it hasn't in my mind. It never changed. Oh. I think for other, maybe for some other people, yeah, it was like, oh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, oh. for, the, for the people who, who... Yeah, I think, I mean, the bottom line, <laughs> I think, is, you know, if, if, if an alien came to Earth and had no sort of background or history uh, and didn't know you know, Hermes or uh, Marc Jacobs um, or you know, any of the brands, you know, and you put two bags up, you put one bag from Hermes and another bag from, um, you know, Michael Kors. Mm. And, you know, uh, naked eye, might, they might look similar and, and one is $10,000 and another is 500. Mm. And, and then trying to explain to that alien, like, why is Hermes so much more expensive? It's obviously hundreds of years of brand heritage and the process and, the, the people who do it and when it's manufactured and the quality of the leather and the stitching and, mm. the, you know, it, 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 but at the, at the base product, it's leather and, and time, right? So I think Alma is not something completely different. Um, there's other things out there that are similar. Mm. And I think it's all in the execution, how we do it, who the people are, who, who are there, who we, who we attract, who we, who we want to have as members and who we... Don't. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So now you, I mean, touching a little bit on where you're going with this concept. Obviously, you started here in Stockholm. Was it it's two years ago now or three almost? We opened in uh, February 2017. All right. So it'll be three years uh, yeah. this, this coming February. Uh, and I know you have plans on opening in other cities. So let's touch on that a, li- a little bit. What's, what's the upcoming plans for Alma? Yeah, but we, um, I think when we started, the logical thinking was we'll start in Stockholm and then we'll open in Copenhagen mm. or Gothenburg or Malmo and Oslo. And, and then quite quickly we realized that, I mean, that makes sense on paper, um, but for a member it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like I've lived half my life or more than half my life in Sweden. Mm. I've been to Oslo once or twice. So if I'm an Alma member in Stockholm, do I really care that Alma also exists in Oslo? Yeah. It's not huge. And is there a word of mouth that travels to Oslo? Maybe that's... Maybe. But I, but, but the idea of, of being able to, you know, for the one or two times, maybe a year I go to Oslo, mm. you know, maybe I'd, maybe not being able to go to Alma there is not such a horrible thing. There's mm. very, you know, there's no economies of scale, different languages. We can't have the same staff. Mm. So so we we started thinking about it much more as a, Sort of like a cluster strategy, which is which is this idea of servicing uh, or being for our members in many different ways where they are, and then kind of moving on. So we, uh, our our uh, our second project is um, is here also in Stockholm. We took over this this movie theater on, on Sturegatan called Park right. Park, and uh, which is this beautiful old, I mean one of the you know. Uh, most beautiful cinemas in, in Sweden. It's uh, 710 seats. It's one of the largest, uh, or the largest, sort of single cinema, single screen cinema left. Mm. And it's right um, by Humlegården as well. So it's yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's 100, you know, 100 meters from, from Stureplan. It's, mm. it's, I mean, the location it couldn't be better. And it's, it was done by this architect, Björn Hiadval, who um, was very functionalistic. He did, I grew up in, in, in Bromma, so he did Engby and then mm. he did Engby Kyrka and Kobe the Konstans bar and he he he's 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 pretty amazing thing and so this this spot um, allows us to give our members a 
different experience, but it's it, for us, it's still around work, right? You know, during the day, the idea is that the movie theater has a perfect setting for, you know, if you have a product launch or a, an event or a um, seminar or a festival or education or shareholder meeting, or, and like, it's perfect for that, the theater style sort of seating mm-hmm. and you can congregate mm-hmm. a lot of people. And then at night, you know, it's a great stage for culture and, and creativity. And we can have live music, we can have poetry, we can have spoken word, we can have comedy, we can have films, obviously, premieres. And, and so one thing can sort of support the other. You know, the, the, the amazing cultural event makes the space more attractive during the day, and the stuff that happens during the day will probably subsidize and pay for some of the stuff that happens at night, which means we don't have to be so commercial. We don't have to show only superhero movies. We can mm. show something, you know, uh, maybe a bit more niche uh, and not... Will you even have superhero movies? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And the one thing I've promised my uh, my ten year old uh, daughter Auden, she is very into Harry Potter at the moment, and so right. we have said we're going to do a Harry Potter festival somehow. So we'll. Bring Daddy has out. a movie theater. You have to have a. <laughs> yeah, Daddy has a movie theater exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting because we, we talked previous, you know, right before we started recording, we talked about li- you know the, the the thing about live content and how that is more you know valuable as we go along and i know we when you started alma you you, you and i think you still have these sort of uh, uh lunch talks you bring in speakers and and so forth how how do you see the the, the progression of live content and how its role in sort of uh, the, the the business community and society <clears throat> i mean i think um for us it's it's crucial i mean i think the the the, the stuff that happens there is is um uh, you know, we do quite a bit, um, and we keep doing more every year. I, I, I think it's, I think it's going to increase. But I think, like everything, you know, we 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 see these, we see these new technologies come out, or we see these new things happen, and, and people sort of try to figure out how to how to get involved in it, and and how to do it in a way that makes sense for them. Uh, I think we've seen in the last few years uh, a lot of companies getting into the content space, uh, and now I think some of the smarter companies are like. Is that really for us? Like, do I? Is it the role of a liquor brand to create content about the art world? Because mm. you know? if I'm really interested in art, am I going to go read, you know, Art Forum, uh, or am I going to go to, you know, vodkabrand.com and read about right. art? You know, are they going to attract the journalists and the editors and the photographers mm. and the mm. And the content makers that that are at the level that 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 um, sort of the, the subject matter deserves, and so I think I think people are are kind of redefining their roles within the ecosystem, which I think is very good, um, and I think it's the same for live content. I think you know there's there's a lot of uninteresting content you know let's get somebody in to talk about their work or you know and, it, and you go to these events and it's two people on stage and they're it's basically reading off a press release right you know I, I mean i don't personally go to a lot of the seminars and things because i find it um it's very rarely that somebody says anything that you haven't already heard mm-hmm. and so if one goes it's because there's the potential to meet someone in at the at the drinks afterwards mm-hmm. so it's a mingle thing so i i think I think that, um, I mean, what I, this is a long bet, and I've been saying this for years, I think that the media industry is going to more and more sort of split into where you have entertainment, which is stuff you pay for, you know, Mm. where you subscribe to a Netflix or an HBO or, or, or you purchase, you know, a subscription to the New York Times and it's quality content. And then there's this sort of information where, you know, how to make, you know, chicken Kiev brought to you by a milk, co- you know what I mean? Like the, mm. it, it's information that can be sponsored by a relevant brand or, or person. It doesn't detract from the integrity of the content. In fact, it might even be, you know, enhancing More credible. It. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, we know a lot about, you know, running because mm. we make shoes and we're going to talk to you about creating a, an exercise program like that. That makes sense. But mm. if, 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 you know, if, if, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think that there's, there's a lot happening, I guess, in, in every industry. I don't know. We're just sort of hanking along. Or yeah, but so did you have like programming res- or, or are you doing that yourself or do you have people sort of curating the content uh, or, or, or editors sort of choosing choosing what to be on the, the, the lunch talks or, you know, in the upcoming uh, movie theater? Yeah, I mean, we, ha- we have people in-house that mm. do that. We have, uh, we hired the, a woman called Sarah Cook who does... Uh, 
to be the general manager of the, of the movie theater. Mm. She came. From, she comes from um, this other movie theater here in Stockholm called Capitol, which yeah. is a yeah. sort of a boutique cinema. So she's done it in the past, and we have a woman called Petra Petra Stienval who does uh, uh, membership and, and programming at, at Alma generally, mm. uh, who sort of oversees it. And then, but then we have you know tons of people who contribute. We have a program manager for the for the bar called Lee Linkvis, who, who has a you know years of experience from yeah. the, from nightlife. Um, so, so there's a team of us that do it, and then and then obviously through our networks, and there's people pitch us ideas or come with ideas, and members come with ideas. So it comes from lots of different direction. But I think the overall, the overall sort of integrity of it is, is obviously set by us, mm. and and we and we also s- spend quite a bit of money on it. I mean, we do we do we do um, fly people in and we pay people because it's ultimately about. F- a you know, I call it credibility. You can call it integrity. You can call it, you know, whatever. But but to, to have your own sort of point of view and, uh, you know, voice or 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 however you want to define it. Uh, to me, that's where we're going. If you don't have that, I mean, you can be a liquor brand and have that and be strong and have a have a you know position on the market, and actually uh, produce something that's relevant. But if you don't have that and you just you know uh, you know you want to churn content out there. I think that's where you go wrong. Uh, and and to me, it's like we're, we're in this uh, in-between area somehow that everyone feels like they need to produce content. Everyone has their own Instagram feed or Twitter feed or blog or, you know, a podcast or whatever. But if a lot of the times, when especially when corporations move into this, they don't haven't decided what this is for and who's it for. Mm. And um, I think that we, we're really going to see a shift there soon where, where people are realizing that their content doesn't actually do anything. It, it just sits there as some kind of, a, I don't know, it's almost like a, a, something you, th- you throw in the face of the consumer or whoever who happens to, to you know, be in the trajectory of this content, if there even is a person in the trajectory of this content, if it just, you know, f- flows out there. Yeah. This is not a question. It's more like something no, no, I've been I, thinking no, about. I th- no, but I think you're right. I think that, um, I mean, I think it is interesting. If you take it from a perspective of a restaurant, mm. you know, people are like, oh, they've heard that storytelling is important. And you go, sometimes you go to these, these restaurants and the, and the waiter or the waitress says, you know, have you been here before? Mm. And uh, it's like, no, I, it's, I'm first time. It's like, oh, let me explain how it works. Or let me explain your, co- you know, our concept to you, mm. and and to me, then you've failed. You know, if it's a restaurant, <laughs> you cook, I pay, I eat, I, li- you know, it's a fairly. And if if I don't intuitively un- understand how this thing works, mm. if you have to spend twenty minutes explaining, mm. you know, how I order off the menu, then maybe you, you need to redesign the menu. Mm. Um, and and you know these made up stories that that um, I think people see through that, you know, and and, and I, it's not. I don't think it's so much about. Um, somebody told me about this restaurant recently where they've made up these characters and they've met, and and it, it's just stupid, you know. It, it's not that's not the storytelling. I think the people mean when they say you tell a story. It's like, mm. no, I opened this restaurant because I did this and I was into that. Or my mom's. It, it can be a very simple. It doesn't have to be so elaborate. Mm. Um, so I, I find that kind of these, these overthought concepts that are just sort of very. Get, they get boring, I think, very early. You go to a great restaurant and you sit down and you understand how it works and then you're interested and you ask, you know, how come this plate is this way? Mm. Well, you know, it's funny you ask because, you know, th- that's the way to do it, mm. not not to spend 20 minutes up front talking about... I think what you're talking about there is if, if you circle back to the formula that you mentioned and you talk about community, I think that's a great sort of... Uh, Test to see if it, if the storytelling works because if you, if if there is a community that can t- can tell this story intuitively and sort of you know organically, uh, then there is actually a relevant story that has you know authenticity and, and value. Yeah. But if you, uh, as you say, if you have to explain it, then it doesn't work. But I think the community part is and that and that is the you know the most difficult thing to achieve for any brand, any you know company, any corporation to actually. Uh, create or uh, I don't think you actually can create a community. You engage people into a community, right? And 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 that's you know super difficult. Yes. <laughs> How do yeah. you do that? 
How do you do that? <clears throat> I mean, I try as much as everybody. I, I mean, for us, again, it's like creating a space that people feel welcomed, mm. uh, safe, maybe a bit spoiled, mm. um, comfortable, um, where there's lots of touch points and opportunities to engage. You know, you can you can come for the food or you can ask about the ceramics or you can be interested in the design or you can be interested in by, you know, the people who are there or you create these sort of friction moments where, you know, you, you run in, run into people, run up against things. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I remember when I worked in advertising, you know, you'd look at, you'd look at all, all the competition. I started very young and we would always feel very insecure about the fact that we were very young and very inexperienced. And we would overcompensate, I think, by creating these elaborate models and trying to sort of create something that was ownable or whatever. And then I remember we were in a pitch um, for a company here in Sweden and, and there was a big agency, like a big network agency that was also pitching and we got to see their deck and we were just blown away how bad it was and, right. and how insecure it, it felt because they were trying to dress up um, the sort of the more artful aspects of communication, which is what you talked about, engaging people and being authentic mm -hmm. in this sort of, you know, academic model. And it just seems sort of silly. And um, I think almost like how the more abstract something is, the more uncomfortable people get. So they try to kind of create this, vernac this vernacular and this thing around it, which doesn't always work. And I think there's some things you can process and some things you can uh, really try and be rigid about um, and some things you can't. You know, I think the, the oldest myth is that creatives like chaos. It's like, I don't think we do. I think people, we want desperate for order so that we can focus on the actual creation part, mm. which, which can be messy, mm. you know, but, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, yeah, I think... It's actually, I think a lot of people have it in them. They just make it so goddamn complicated. It's like you're throwing a dinner party. Like, be a good host, you know? <laughs> Invite interesting people, put them together, and make sure that they are happy and, and fed and, and, you know, uh, lubricated and, you know, clean the bathrooms and put some music on. I mean, you know what I mean? And you can overthink that and have the, you know, fly in a chef from somewhere and then invite people who don't like each other and the party will be crap. You know, it's, I think people overthink it a lot. From that perspective, because uh, the show is obviously called The Innovators, we'd like to talk about innovation from a sort of broad perspective, and I'm curious about people from different fields uh, defining it. So, so what does innovation mean to you? Well, what does innovation mean to me? Um... I mean, I guess it's it's trying to find a new solution to a to a problem, right? To, or try to find a new way of doing something. Um, I guess I haven't thought about it. <laughs> it's an interesting, you know. We use these words content and experience and content, you know, and then we don't actually kind of think about always what we mean by it. Mm. But um, I don't know, just doing things that are that are different, or or imagining things that aren't quite haven't happened yet i guess that's what it is i get a sense that you 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 i mean given your uh, uh how you're sort of attracted to research and going back to history uh, is doing your homework sort of is that important to doing uh reading up on this concept as you know like you said before throwing a dinner party it's about the right type of guests good food yeah yeah there's some basics there that you have to get right uh, I'm sure that can be applied to any problem. Like if you go into any problem, is there an old solution that you have to at least know about before creating a new solution? Yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> I read somewhere uh, recently that people who are, who are sort of more creative, they, they tend to just have access to more parts of their brain, as in, as in they are able to bring in more information, which means that they have more information to draw from when they solve their problems. Right? And and I think, of course, the more experience you have, the more, I mean, the older I get, the quicker I solve problems. Because mm. I've seen them before, there's patterns, or there's like, I, you know, I know what this is. I recognize that. Or I recognize my own behavior in the situations, or I, 
I know that I'm going to be nervous there, so I'm going to prepare myself for this. You know, like you know, getting older, I think, is awesome because you're, you know, you're, um, you're more experienced. Mm. So yeah, of of course, there's uh, the more information you have, you can draw from history, you can draw from, um, from past experiences. Um, but again, I think. I think that. Um, I mean, I think if you listen to the like, really smart people, the way that they try to explain their process, it's it, it becomes words like magical and things are connected. Becomes you know, I mean, Einstein talked about that, like mm. that he thought the universe was magical, and it's and I think that there's something to that. It's hard to kind of explain your own process because it's um, it becomes really cliche very fast, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and it's I don't know just pick up things along the way. You're like, I was at that restaurant. It was really beautiful. Why was it nice? Oh, and the lighting was really amazing. And then you take that and you, you know, piece it together, I think. Um, oh. So let's, let's go from this sort of more intuitive state into the, you mentioned the formula before, and I know you're, you're looking at uh, opening other uh, spaces. Uh, I think there's one on the way in, in Palma de Mallorca. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like you've sort of nailed the the, the formula of, of Alma or, or uh, the the members club and the restaurant better now when creating uh, a new space? I think that we have a better understanding of what makes Alma, the, the original one, work. Mm. Um, what is that? Well, I think the food and the beverage and the that aspect played a much bigger role in the success than we ever imagined. You know, people, I think if you talk to people, one of the first thing they will say is, oh, I went to lunch, the food is amazing, the mm. lunch is amazing. Mm. And and I think we always knew that that was important. I don't think we knew how important it is. Mm. You, know, the, you know, since we opened the bar, it, it's the same thing there. People talk about the bar and it's like, oh my God, what is, you know, this product is amazing. So, um, so that's part of it. Uh, I think that we have some ideas, some sort of hypothesis around what, what Palma and, and Park and these other places can be. We feel quite comfortable that we'll get some of it right and a lot of it wrong, you know, and then we have to tweak it. But, you know, our formula is not, I think it's based around uh, the type of person we want to attract and kind of the, um, the kind of activities that we think are relevant to that person rather than, you know, the, the, the space we're opening in Palma is not going to, there'll be, I think you'll recognize yourself if you've, if you've been to, to the one in Stockholm, but it's not going to be the same. Mm. Um, it's not going to be the same because it isn't, you know. Uh, we're not going to try to force it to be something that it's not. So they will all be different. I mean, I was interviewed when we opened Park, and the journalist asked me, do you think, do you think it's confusing to people that uh, a co-working space is taking over a movie theater? And, and my response was, I don't know who you mean when you say people. I don't think it's confusing to our members. I think it makes perfect right. sense to them. Like, of course, I, I mean, great. I have a film I want to show. I have a product mm-hmm. launch I want to have. When I, you know, I need a space for it. So um, the formula for us is, you know, as I said, it's community design, uh, programming, food, and, and, and beverage. And those mm-hmm. those five things, I think, are are constant. But I don't think they will look exactly the same mm-hmm. everywhere. Is the reason you're you, uh, going into Palma is because it's so strong with the Swedish uh, community, or is it more like a happenstance? It it, uh, it came up quite um, sort of randomly. One mm. one of our uh, board members um, was uh, traveling there, and and it came up as a suggestion that perhaps we should look at 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 uh, Mallorca and Palma. And I was very skeptical, to be honest, because I had this idea. Mallorca was a place, was the place it was when we were kids. Right. Um, and so I went there and I was, you know, very hesitant um, and was really blown away by um, how wrong I was about the idea. So there's definitely sort of the the charter tourism aspect to it. But there's, you know, there's a very large community of, of, of people there, uh, Swedes for sure, but there's, there's English people, there's French people, there's Germans, there's, you know, it's become this sort of little hub in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean that attracts lots of interesting people, actually, people who live there year round, people who come for, for extended period of times and, or people who travel there quite back and forth to kind of do a project or finish a project. 
And so it made a lot of sense for us. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the sort of the cluster strategy of, the, of, of creating a, a, you know, a, a many things that service our members in different aspects, you know, it made sense for us to have, you know, the, the New Bogotan space, the, the theater, and then also in Palma. So like there are groups of people who can travel to finish a project there or, or uh, you know, go there on vacation or team building. So mm. it, it made sense. It fit into our, to our um, little strategy there. And then we found this building that we fell in love with, and um, it all came together. So it's actually grown now. So it started with one project, and now we have three <laughs> in, in wow. Palma. Yeah. So, so yeah. is there a next logical step after that? Well, we're opening in New York mm -hmm. in, in the new year, and or in, it depends on when this is broadcast, but in early 2020, we're opening in New York. Right. Um, and um, it'll be much smaller than the space here. Uh, and we're calling it so Alma Living Room. Mm. We're trying that out to see if we can create uh, th these little micro almas, if you will, that are maybe even more curated to a specific uh, type of person or type of industry. Mm. Um, so the one that we're opening um, is on Great Jones Street and between uh, Bowery and Lafayette, which is, uh, I just love that area. And I've always loved that area. And, it, it, and we're going to focus on design and hospitality and food and beverage around that mm. that space in, in particular. So, uh, so, um, so not a bunch of desks. No, there will be there will be an area that's more for dedicated work, mm. and then there'll be one area that's more about the social aspect mm. uh, to it. But you know, but you know, we'll build the kitchen and a bar and all that stuff. But it's it's more catered to, to those types of people because though they, they, those people have a certain need. If you're if you're catering to media companies, then you know maybe a podcast studio or or you know large format printers or you know, or, or a photo studio is 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 really important. You know, if you're catering to people who are more in the sort of maker space, then maybe you need you know machinery and mm. and and three um, D printers and stuff like that. You know, a place where you can get messy. So that I think different people have different needs, and we feel that there's there's a way to in Stockholm maybe the community is small enough that we can kind of gather a lot of people in one spot. But I think in places like a New York or, or you know, big, big, big cities, then maybe we need to break it up a bit. Mm. So talk to me about your design philosophy, because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you also have a furniture brand uh, yeah. called Austere that, that uh, you know, I think previously was another type of design uh, concept, but moved into becoming this furniture uh, line or furniture collection. So, uh, and, and do, do you consider yourself, you know, do you define yourself as someone who is in the design industry? Or is that something that you do to sort of, you know, back up the the, the member club or, or the stuff you do for your members? Well, when we started Austere, um, the idea was actually much closer to a media product than mm. anything else. So we the idea was to sort of help Scandinavian design companies into the United States. You know, background as a consultant, I was working with a lot of, mm. not, not just companies from Sweden, but people with that design ethos or that company ethos to, to kind of enter the United States. And I noticed that a lot of them had the same kind of problems and the same kind of questions. And, and one of the things they all needed was a place to show their stuff. And so Austere was, was, it was a, um, was a pop-up that uh, was supposed to be for six months and ended up being, you know, we, a little over two years. And in LA, right? In LA, exactly. We were part of uh, the kind of retransformation of, of, uh, of downtown mm -hmm. LA. So they call it the Broadway A, so it was uh, Ace Hotel, Acne, Aesop, Austere, and one more that I'm forgetting. But you know, all of us kind of opened similar times, and we we um, really changed the, the that area. But it was it was sort of like a magazine you could walk into. Mm. If the pages of, of Scandinavian Man kind of came to life, and all the different things you write about, and the food, and the music, and the furniture, and the clothes, and kind of if they were all in a space, that that was kind of what we were about. So we worked with everybody from Volvo to teenage engineering mm. to Vest by Lighting to Stutterheim, you know, so like a whole group of people that came together. And 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 after two years, I was uh, quite tired of selling other people's things because a lot of the a lot of the partners we had were there were sort of structural problems in in their business where it, it made it very difficult to be a retailer. Mm. Um, and so and we were doing maybe too many things. We were, we were doing media, we were doing events, we were consulting for people, we were creating content, we were 
selling things both uh, in the store and online, and, and we were a bit schizophrenic. So, so I decided to shut the space and um, sort of stop selling other people's things in that way and focus on kind of creating our own line. So we, we launched uh, in 2017. We launched uh, our first collection of furniture. And, then, and, and what's happened is when, when we design things, when I design things um, for Alma, uh, or for uh, other projects, I kind of put it into I kind of put it into austere, um, so that the product kind of lives on in 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 that company. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what, what what I try to do. Um, do you see yourself as a designer, or is that more like creative direction as well? Um, I mean, I if it's about sort of building on things and 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 man made pro man made things or processes, which I guess mm -hmm. design is, then mm -hmm. then yes. Mm. Uh, I'm not trained as a designer. I didn't go to school for design. I was a I was a writer. Mm. Or I was trained to be a writer. Um, I don't know. I think I'm a creative director or a producer or editor. I think it's very similar. Mm. Like I bring things together and I work with different people. And I don't know. It's but I like the design process. I think it's the you know iterative building on things, um, collaborating. Uh, having a you know setting out to do s to solve a problem and then kind of being okay with that the process there might it, you know the thing might change on the way uh, I'm very comfortable with that process and how often do you launch new products or, or are within you austere it, yeah. again it's 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 very opportunistic you know yeah. when we when when I you know I did a I did a dresser uh, for somebody that I then put into a to into the collection we've done um, we did for the space in uh, in LA. Uh, we work with Absolute, and we created a bar, mm. uh, a bar piece of furniture that uh, that we're going to put into. A, we're, we're, we're tweaking it, but we're going to put that into production. We have you know, this. It's, it's very. It's, I mean, it's almost like a hobby, but mm. it, you know, it, it, things kind of happen as they happen. Mm. Um, so, yeah. and do you consider yourself as, as uh, you know typically Scandinavian brand, or you are you? I mean, I. Do you, do you subscribe to some some kind of Scandinavian design tradition? Do you feel? I mean, I think if by the Scandinavian design you, you mean sort of respecting material and making the everyday special and kind of um, uh, using you know natural materials and and uh, kind of putting functionality and beauty you know kind of on equal footing then yes absolutely mm. um you know austere was never about sweden necessarily we did tons of things we designed from japan and mm. from um Eng you know england and the united states i mean you have designers like ilsa crawford who's british or jasper morrison who's who's also british but he's probably one of the most prolific sort of scandinavian designers ar around mm. you know although he didn't grow up here um so I, I think the geospecificity of it is maybe less interesting to me than the than the process. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to box you in here to see if uh, if, you, if you fit anywhere in terms yeah. of. Um, but I mean, obviously, you're you're a Swede living in. You've been lived in New York for almost your entire um, career, right? Yeah, I moved there in uh, 2000, so right. I was 24. Yeah dating myself here but yes <laughs> no, I'm no, um, yeah so I had I had started an agency when I was quite I started an agency called Graceland when I was 21 mm. right after um, after school and and uh, we sold it uh, in in 2000 to a company called Acom which is, I don't think is around anymore but so then so then I moved so I had a little mini career here before I moved but yeah the, my my adult life most of it has been in, the, in New York and has it been important for you to to when you know pursuing your your career in New York to to uh, are you like the Swede in New York or do do people don't care where you come from? I think no, I'm not the Swede. I I, I when I moved there, I um, I think this the the sort of the Swedish New York thing goes in waves. I think there was waves before me. There was a bunch of. Um, photographer and fashion people and graphic designers mm. um, that were a few years older than me that were that had been there and some of them had gone home by the time I got there and then the next wave were kind of the um, uh, the digital which came a bit later so I think when I was there there weren't that many I mean there was of course lots of Swedes but I'm the, my community wasn't really there so I didn't really spend a ton of time with uh, with other Swedes mm. and 
I mean, I have lots of Swedish friends, but it, it, you know, it's not because they're Swedish. I'm not, I'm not a huge like, you know, patriot in that way. <laughs> um, so I, I think a lot of my American friends didn't really know that I was Swedish when we became friends. It was, it wasn't the Swedishness that defined it. Um, it yeah. feels like you you create sort of boomerang back to Scandinavia in a way. Well, with the austere uh, project that was uh, was is it ten years ago or something? No, it's uh, we launched it in twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Oh, yeah. it's not. It's five yeah. years ago. Yeah. So and and from from there you did sort of the Alma mm-hmm. and now the austere become a furniture yeah. brand, uh, very sort of Scandinavian in touch. Was this a, a plan for you or or was it more like uh, coincidences that that made you come back to Stockholm? Is your family still back in New York? There's no like yeah, you know, you yeah. I mean, I have my m- mom and dad and brother are mm. in, mm. in Sweden, and my my wife and my daughter are in uh, in New York. Um, no, I mean, I you know, I think it's the, I think it's the kind of immigrant experience. You know, like I'm rootless in between two places. I I love Sweden. Mm. I think you know, I think in some ways I appreciate it more when I've gone away and come back. I think sometimes you have to leave in order to come home and 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 see what's good and bad about mm. something uh there was a couple of years when i didn't come home a lot um i i felt uh i, di- I didn't appre- i didn't love coming here as a tourist mm. um so I, i much prefer having like a, a reason to come and business and, and and things here um yeah and i you know i think i don't know i think it wasn't a plan but uh you know a lot of my projects you know i have rum company and i'm involved in a men's beauty line and there's a few things and i think that there's a there's a thread of sort of scandinavian design ethos throughout throughout them mm. um but that's just you know it's like you know you have a thread of fashion and you know it's like why am i that's who you are mm. it's, you know, there's no master plan behind it it's just <laughs> what do you think about the the, the sort of scandinavian brand uh, globally right now is it is it uh, attractive to be scandinavian Um yeah I th- I think it's I think it is I think there there is a um I maybe this is political but I I I think that there is That's okay. We we got something really right I think. Um when we built or we I wasn't alive but th- this idea of the f- the people's home or folk mm. camp like mm. you know and 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 I think There were a bunch of stuff that happened, uh, so sort of building these big societal changes is is very difficult. I think it create you know you need sort of a mum, you know big happening. You know you had the you know the, the Great Depression created the New Deal in the United States. You had you know you had massive poverty in Sweden that cr- created kind of the, the folk, or you had a world war that created the folk and all that you know rebuilding rebuilding Europe and then putting that money into into the fall camp it was was incredibly smart um i think that we have sort of over the, over some time sort of starting to dismantle that and i think that sweden is still living a little bit on borrowed time i think people mm-hmm. are like talking about like how amazing things are um and i think that some there's some chips in the you know the the paint the paint's chipping um i and that worries me i think that uh i think that we need I get very contrarian when I hear people talking about the Swedish, you know, the, the, how amazing we are in music and fashion. Like we, we, I think there's a little bit. The last few years, we sit around and pat ourselves on the back how mm. amazing everything is. Mm. There's some great value systems and and sort of structural societal things that have happened in Sweden that I think we have to be very careful not to dismantle. Dismantling is is, is quite easy, but like look at the United States. They've been trying to uh, tackle the healthcare um problem for 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 decades mm. it's really difficult to do it right you know and and i think if we start dismantling those things it's going to be really hard to rebuild it mm. um and i think it's not that the system is you know broken and needs to be replaced it needs to be fixed it needs to be improved it needs to be don't tear the house down just mm. remodel it um so i do sort of almost involuntarily get very sort of uncomfortable when when I get questions like why are we so great here you know why what is the magic 
I, th I don't think there's something in the water that makes us mm. better than anybody else. I think there are, I mean, look at the tech and innovation thing. One of the reasons that we have been able to build these amazing companies is not that we just have better ideas than people. It's that we have a long history of uh, great middle managers at these big companies that, that are able to take an idea and commercialize it. Uh, I mean, you have you know thousands of people who worked at Ericsson and 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 Volvo, and they, you know, who take these like technical innovation and then like pump it out into the, like, the whole world. That mm -hmm. you know, it, that's hard coming up with an app that like we want to be the LinkedIn for creative people and connect cool people. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not hard to do that to build that app. You know, you can do it in an afternoon to commercialize that, to take it out into the whole world, to to build factories, to build. I mean, you take the you know the take Uber and Amazon. Uber, there's a hundred different Uber-like apps. It's not, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not that hard. Building the warehousing and the infrastructure and the last mile, like the, what Amazon has done, that is a, that's hard to replicate. Mm. If you and I wanted to start Am you know, compete with Amazon, it's going to be really difficult. Mm. To start a ride-sharing app, it's not as hard. So I think that it's the combination of, you know, having had, you know, good public education, putting money into arts and music and, 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 and sort of uh, those types of things that we've been doing for, for some time. Uh, the fact that we live far away, we have a sort of geographic disadvantage that it's, you know, you have to fly for hours just to get out of the country, which means that I think we're curious about, we read things, we're, we're curious about stuff. And then having, you know, you know disproportionately a, a large amount of no, a number of, of companies that are, that are, uh, around the world you know we have we used to have you know three car companies and and we have pretty big industry uh, for a small country and i think all that talent is amazing um and i think that's one big part of our success when it comes to scaling these companies i don't think i've ever heard anyone explain the sort of scandinavian phenomena with middle managers i think that was a new, a new take on it that i <laughs> i like that yeah. Um. I think there's for me there's there's sort of two two ways of obviously I've I've been you know traveling the world now for two years with the Scandinavian man brand and uh, discovered a, f a few things. One is that this this almost like this utopia internationally with uh, you know uh, Trump and all these sort of political things happening and, and sometimes you, you stumble upon people who. who or, or articles that are about like the utopia of Scandinavia, where you know everyone, ev everything is super equal and it's the most sustainable countries in the world, and, and so forth. And I think when you when you live here, you're like, well, we have you know right wing extremists, and uh, we have our issues, and and so forth. So it's almost like this. Uh, um, I guess utopia is the is the best word for it. The other thing is that when you when you travel out into the world, and as you say. Uh, if if you work with fashion or music or or whatever, we we have this especially from Sweden. I think I think the Danes are more sort of rooted in their own sort of culture and country. But the Swedes, we're like we think there's this uh, you know either like a fashion wonder or a music wonder or something that that takes over the world. And then you go to London or Milan or Paris or whatever, and they don't. I, I mean, I I I went around to all the fashion weeks for uh, one season talking about uh, Scandinavian brands and top editors at top magazines couldn't mention, you know, two Scandinavian fashion brands. They could, you know, mention one. Hmm. And that was sort of... Uh, and, it was, and it was H&M, probably, or maybe Acne. Uh, it was, uh, you, you yeah. with, the, with the editor, it was, it was Acne. Right. It was almost like H&M, it's almost like they don't know it's Swedish. Because yeah, it's I know people, I know, so I've met people who don't know that Ikea is Swedish. And exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know... Yeah, so so it's it's like this self image is sometimes uh, uh, this deception. Uh, at other times, it gets sort of reinforced by these articles about us being sort of this uh, this uh, you know uh, wondrous corner of the world where equality you know is uh, you know in abundance somehow. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I I I, I it's a big side. I get. No, I I. I um. I just don't care. I, I'm to be honest. I just I don't know why people care so much. I really find it fascinating. I mean, you meet people who have this this sense of this deep sense of uh, nationalism mm. 
and I don't, I don't understand that. I really don't. And I, same way that people talk about their university and it's like, it defines who they are as people. Like I went to Harvard, I went to this school and it's like, it's who I am as a person. And I find that to be really sad. Like really, that is, it's wonderful that you went there. Of course it formed you and, and you, you know, you, you were accepted for one reason and you came out of there. But like to, to think that that is sort of, it's this very fixed mindset that somehow because you were born in one place, that is who you are as a person. Of course it informs you. I mean, culture informs us. It's this sense that, I mean, we have a culture. No, no country's figured it out 100%. We're, we're all trying to, f you know, solve a specific problem with, with culture, you know. And, and I think in, in, in Sweden or in, in Nordic countries, there's a particular type of, you know, um, way of living your life that is different than if you live in, you know, in, in warmer climates or in, in other places in the world or other times in history. Mm. Uh, but I think that this sense that, that it's somehow destined or, or, or you know, I, I, don't, I find that very, I find it incredibly uninteresting because it, it's so, I don't know, it, it makes it fixed. It makes it like, I am Swedish, therefore, mm. which is, I don't subscribe to that. Like mm -hmm. I'm Swedish and, and, and some of these things, like I, I, you know, I've been taught to do s things a certain way or, you know, certain things are more important to me than other things. Like summer, you know, I have a different relationship to summer than, than if you've grown up in a, you know, mm -hmm. you know first five or 10 years living in, the, in New York, I would, I, and I still get this sometimes, like when it's sunny outside, I'm like, we got to go outside. We got to go outside. <laughs> and it's, you know, 40 degrees and super humid. And everyone's like, why the hell would you go outside? It's disgusting. Let's be inside. Yeah. And I have, you know, my mother's voice and, you know, thousands of years of Swedish, like, it's sunny, go outside. And of course, that's <laughs> like in my thing. And, and you can reflect on that and you can sort of laugh at it or you can, but I don't think it defines me as a person. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that if you, if you let it, then, then you get stuck. That's what we, I mean, I think, the, the right wing uh, wins that we have. I mean, I, I totally understand where they're coming. Mean, I think we all do. We get where they're coming from. I don't think, you know, the people who voted for Trump or the people who voted for Brexit or the people who voted for the, for, vote for the Swedish, Sweden Democrats, I think they, they long for a simpler time that didn't really exist, you know. It, it, it's, it's sort of, like, we evolve. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, I think as a, as a, as a, as a man... You know, if you can't say, you know, we have, you know, as a species, we have like 70,000 years on this planet and we have subjugated women for pretty much all of it. Um, and, you know, we can't change history. We can only sort of rewrite the future and we can only, you know, but, but this idea of, of, of being, you know, feeling this sort of sense of like, you know, I really miss the times when I could like club a woman on the head and drag her into my cave. Like we've evolved from that. So, so this idea of being so terrified of that type of change, whether it's, you know, about immigrants coming to, to, to Sweden or uh, about women, you know, taking a different role than they have in the past. I, I, I just, I just think it's just, it's just change. It's, it's, it's exciting, but I understand that people get scared, you know, that they feel that the, the rights that they were given at birth to have certain things, have, 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 it's changed. But the thing that I really find interesting in, in this country is that, as I mentioned earlier, I think we, you know, we're dismantling some things that are very core to who we are as people and, and the things that have, have worked. I mean, uh, you know, if it would, be, it would make more sense for me to move you know, the little money that I have to Sweden because I would pay less tax here than I do in New York. Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, you don't have, you don't have real estate tax here. You, you know, income, uh, uh, you know, income on capital gains is, mm -hmm. is very low. If you have a company, you don't really pay tax. Um, we we tax uh, salary. You know, mm. your your um, income tax is mm. is what's taxed, right? Which is, I mean, kind of to me, it really goes against the sort of the the, the basic social democratic values of you know. Time is the one non-renewable resource, and that is taxed the highest. If I own shares in a company, or if, you know, then that's not taxed very high. I, I find that very strange. And I think you know, I have friends here who it's coming to the point where it's like, yeah, schools are really bad, so um, you know, I don't feel like paying into the tax system anymore. I don't feel bad about cheating 
cheating right. the government from right. because the schools are so bad. It's like, well, they go together. Mm -hmm. right? It's not, you know, and I think that's what we see in the United States. I think, you know, so I think we get got it. I think we have to get our, 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 um, our ducks straight when it comes to like, what is it that we value? What are the things about being Swedish or the, the Scandinavian model that, that we appreciate? And let's stop sort of just talking superficially about how awesome we are without kind of getting to the things. Like, yes, yeah, some things we do really well. Some things we do terrible. Um, and I think that, that honest conversation is, is very much missing, I think, from the, from the civil discourse. And, and I don't hear any of the political parties talking about it. No. I really enjoy talking to you about this. And, I, and this is one of the things uh, I think that's been sort of recurring in our conversations is because you have this different perspective on Scandinavia. I think one of the things th that I've have had to... Uh, We've done some soul searching with our own brand because we sort of paint ourselves in the corner, calling mm. it Scandinavian Man. Which I said to you the first time we met. I think you, you did. Yes. I think you did. And and uh, you know one of the things I want to do is uh, you know, things with this podcast and so forth is to more create like a platform to discuss these things on, mm. rather than having this sort of predictable varnish of these. Uh, values or themes or, or whatever you want to call it. And, and I'm certainly guilty of, of doing that myself, promoting uh, a certain kind of uh, Swedishness or Scandinavianness ness uh, to, to the world. Um, so it's really interesting to hear your, your, your uh, perspective on it. And, and I think one of the things that is important is to have it be not something that is fixed or, right. or you know, it has to be more fluid than that, or true, or or changeable. I, I don't know what's the word here, really. Yeah, uh, and I think you're you're that's what you're talking about as well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think, I think, um, I mean, you look you look at culture, mm -hmm. you know, which is the, sort of the operating system. We have laws for things, and we have culture. Cultures are the operating system of like how do we live our lives, right? And it needs to be fluid. And, and we see how it can change really quickly. It can go from, you know, I mean, take, take gay rights. Uh, it, you know, when I you know, go back five, six years, the idea that, uh, that uh, a gay marriage would be legal in the United States was just unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And then pretty quickly it sort of happened. And now it's being dismantled in some states. You know, it, it's these things are fluid, and I think you know it could be for the better, or it could be for the worse. And I think what um, I don't know, I, th I feel, I feel that we are not great here about having these. We're a little intellectually lazy sometimes. I feel we we kind of smooth things over, and we mm. talk about things in this these sort of broad, broad ways. And I mean, I, I mean. Take the fact that I know more people here in Sweden that have been burnt out uh, or, or kind of depressed mm. uh, than I do anywhere else in the world. And we have five weeks vacation by law. We have tons of holidays. People go home early. We, they, you know, they, they're home with their kids when they're sick. They you know, have summer houses. They, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, on the surface, it's a pretty... Nice life. I remember when I ran, uh, uh, we had uh, ran a Great Works, which is a digital agency. I ran the New York office, and one of the biggest challenges was that the staff in in New York, who you know, they looked at the staff in Sweden and were like, "What the hell are they being paid?" Like they, you know, and I knew that my staff made more money than the people here in Sweden, mm -hmm. and yet they had summer houses and vacations, and that that my staff in New York just couldn't afford. Mm. And and it was this huge, it was a cultural. Um, problem that we had and yet you come here and these people who like who seem to have these pretty chill life are very often just incredibly depressed or or burnt out and i i think that's interesting why is that is it that we have too much time to think about stuff and that's why we get burnt out is it this this sense that the pressure of of sort of living up to this fantastically happy uh perfect veneered life mm. that that's what are we lazy? I don't know what it, what it is, you know. And I think, or do we put a light on it? Do we do we define it? Or maybe, the, or maybe that's what maybe everybody else is super depressed, and we yeah. just you know I don't know do other things. And and here you talk about it, and therefore you it's more accepted to be. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I it, it definitely fascinates me that that uh, 
yeah, it's like, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I, I have a fairly good insight into people's working habits because I have people who come to Alma mm. and I was shocked in the beginning <laughs> how empty it is at a certain time and how, oh, how long true. the holidays have a date on that. I do have data <laughs> on that, you know, and I, I'm not going to rat my members out, but there's definitely, you know, there's definitely like holidays that extend into, you know, the, if there's a holiday on a Wednesday, then that whole week people, people are gone off. We have clem dogger, squeezed, squeezed days. Squeezed days. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I think those, those days, <laughs> they become more and more. Mm. Um, I don't know. How much does uh, technology affect your work or, or how much do you think about how, how technology is changing our work habits? And mm. I mean, I think, I don't know. I think that productivity is something that, um, I mean, I think, I, I don't know. I don't have the statistics for it, but I, I would, Im- I would imagine that a, a big half of like the amount of, uh, startups in the tech space are around, uh, productivity related, mm. uh, you know, uh, collaborative tools, calendars, uh, conference apps like there's th- obviously we're we're struggling to figure out how to work together and be more productive um i um i mean i don't know how to answer your question i um i th- i think that, that my work is mostly um affected in the in the in the changing habits of people like people mm. work differently uh, and therefore, we have a role to play. Um, but I don't know. N- n- I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question, actually. Well, I mean, one of the things that is interesting about these workplaces is that the, the physical space becomes more and more important in a sort of more digital environment, in a way. And And we talked about sort of live content before. Live content becomes more valuable in a more in a more digital life. Right. Um, so that's certainly w- uh, one aspect about it. Uh, but there's, you know, obviously other uh, evolutions that are happening in terms of do we even need people that work anymore if, if uh, you know, AI-like technologies are, are taking over a more sort of, uh, you know, to start with m- mundane uh, work f- um, tasks, mm. but, but increasingly, like, uh, you know, like lawyers and stuff like that will be less needed because you know a big part of what they do is just look through inf- vast amount of information and you don't need that anymore if if there's a, a computer that can s- scroll through it uh, for you and make right. assumptions and so forth. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, I think I think that there are other co-working spaces or these communal workspaces or these solutions for how we interact uh, that talk a lot about productivity. Mm -hmm. It talks about being effective. And I think that there's a, you know, they're usually called, you know, work and factory and the, you know, and it has that kind of, you know, they're designed for that era. Mm -hmm. At the center of it, at the center of this sort of, these these buildings is a giant coffee machine, which is sort of the fuel, the, the, you know, the, the work mm. and and I find that to be kind of funny because we are not going to win. We as a s- sort of Swedish New York, like we're not going to win the productivity mm. war. I mean, we have there are currently countries in the world where a normal week uh, work week is six days, and it's from say seven in the morning to nine at night. And mm. so we've already lost <laughs> that in, from a Swedish perspective, and and with AI. And, and those types of uh, of improvements, obviously, that's gonna that's gonna disappear even more. So, so for us, it's about how do you create a space not for productivity? How do you create a, create a space for creativity? And I think that those are different. I think designing a, an office to foster creativity is not the same as doing it for productivity. And I think that there's in, again in structural um, in society there are lots of um, lots of structures that are built on an old model. You know. Where, it, where it's uh, the assembly line sort of mentality is becoming obsolete. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, if technology, of, of course, technology in all its forms I- I- interact with us. But I think, like, I find it laughable when, you know, there's a, another co-working space here in, in the city that that uh, 
made a big thing about they, they put a chip in your arm mm. where you could open doors and things. You know, I, I find that to be just ridiculous um, because it's, I would much rather have somebody uh, welcome me at, uh, at my office and, and in a personal way. And, hey, Frederick, how are you? How was your weekend? You know, your guest has arrived and, you know, I'll bring you coffee than to have a chip uh, yeah. to open the door. That, it's just, to me, that's just... It's like a gimmick. It's a gimmick. It's stupid, you know? And, and uh, so I think, you know, technology is great uh, if it's in the service of a better person, but it can also be really bad um, or, or just be superfluous. And I think there's a lot of silly things. We're going to wrap up soon. I uh, want to be respectful of your time here. Mm. And, and I'm just curious about in your uh, research right now or in the projects that you're working on or, or in anything, uh, what are you most excited about right now? Ooh. I am excited about... Um, hmm. I mean... W- I'm excited about opening these new spaces and, mm. and sort of seeing what Alma will, how it will evolve and, and how it will be different. Uh, I'm really excited about New York. I think that would be super cool. We, I love this street that we're on. And um, um, I am excited about... I, I, I don't know. We, we, we are doing a lot of different things. I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really... I think we've gotten to the point now where we can start expanding, not just by opening more things, but also expanding out and kind of doing other things. We're we're mm. we're looking to um, kind of create a, a, a lab fund platform where we can actually start investing in in some of the ideas that we see within mm. our walls. That's something we're doing. Um, I think there will be um, a lot of interesting content and 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 sort of. Uh, events and things happening around the movie theater. So I, for me, it's 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 um, kind of figuring out what the Alma brand will become. That to me is the, the product. That to me is very interesting. And what else? Christmas is coming right. up. Um, and, uh, Do you want to recommend something? I want to recommend uh, a new beauty brand, actually called Om, which is. Uh, which is uh, created by an old friend of mine, a guy called Matthias Krieg, who is, um, he, uh, he lived in New York for many years, and then he lived here for a while, and he started all these uh, night, uh, this restaurant, he started Shoget and mm. Andebru, and then all these amazing uh, bars and restaurants, and he's just launched this, this uh, product, which is developed for, for men. He comes from this long line of, of barbers and, and hairdressers, and, and uh, it just launched this week, actually, in New York, in, in, in uh, uh, Basquiat's old studio on Great Jones Street, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. I'm li- all right. Om, Om, yeah, H O M M E, man right. in French. We'll check it out, Frederick. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. For Let's do this again sometime, perhaps in the new space in New York or something like that. I'd love that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been the Innovators, an interview show from Scandinavian Man with me, Conrad Olson. We'll be back soon with more conversations on design, culture, fashion, technology, and sustainability. For more news and interviews from the Scandinavian fashion and culture scene, visit scandinavianman.com. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.